Uh, we're going to move on to our first speaker, and we are very pleased to be able to welcome uh, Mr. Ralph Lopian. Uh, Ralph is chair of the International Steering Committee for the International Year of Plant Health 2020. He is the, also the deputy chief plant health officer of Finland and coordinates international phytosanitary affairs of the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Finland. He's held various positions with the plant pathology department at the University of Helsinki, the National Plant Protection Service of Finland and the Secretariats of the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization and the International Plant Protection Convention. He was chair of the IPPC Commission as well as its vice chair for several election periods and has been the international champion for the proclamation of the International Year of Plant Health. The last six years, he has been chairing IPPC and FAO steering committees preparing for this International Year of Plant Health. So uh, really, he, he is going to speak to us today about keeping our world green, raising the profile of plant health. Uh, we give a warm welcome to Ralph Lopian and please start this presentation now. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and a privilege to be invited to provide this keynote address at this Plant Health Conference of the International Association of Horticultural Producers. I'm going to talk about keeping our world green and how plant health and a better cooperation between the public and the private sector can help achieve this goal. My name is Ralph Lopian. I'm the chairperson of the International League of Plant Health's International Steering Committee, and my contact details you can find on this slide of the presentation. I would like you to imagine a world without plants. How does it look like? And the picture which comes immediately to one's mind is brown sand dust rock. A world where there is no life, like here in the Namibian desert, and a world where no people walk the earth, perhaps with the exception of these two fellows. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the imaginations of a world without life, without plants, and our plants are threatened from invasive exotic pests and diseases. These were the overarching reasons why the United Nations declared the year 2020 as the International Year of Plant Health. But there are also other reasons why it is needed to increase the public awareness about plant health through such an international year. Ladies and gentlemen, plant health risks and challenges are increasing. One of the major drivers of this increase is international trade. Over the last 30 years, we have seen an almost exponential increase of international trade and also international agricultural trade. What we see also is new pathways which can transpose pests and diseases from one country to another. For instance, wooden packaging material. Imagine a consignment of washing machines going from country A to country B. These washing machines are not a risk for plant pests to be transposed from one country to another. However, the wooden pack pallets on which these washing machines are placed are very much a risk of transposing pests and diseases. We see disturbances in and the weakening of ecosystems, and it is well known that weakened or disturbed ecosystems fall much easier prey to pests and diseases. And we have climate change. Climate change, which changes our climatic parameters so that there is greater danger of new pests coming into our ecosystems, which would never have survived before. These risks are in particular increased by the challenges which national plant protection organizations face. We have seen over the last years and decades that the resources of national plant protection organizations are diminishing. We have seen that plant health research has been reduced in many, many countries of this world. We have seen that individual disciplines, 
in the plant health field, like for instance taxonic, taxonomic expertise, is decreasing substantially and are almost extinct nowadays. And we have seen less diagnostic services in countries. These challenges increase the risk that pests and diseases come from one country to another undetected. These were the reasons for the International Year of Plant Health. The International Year of Plant Health 2020 is an effort to raise the public and political awareness of plant health, to help governments and the international community to address these challenges for plant health. Plant health will, in effect, help humankind to achieve some of its most pressing objectives. It helps to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals in the UN Sustainable Development Agenda. And there are a number of these goals which are partially addressed by plant health. What I would like to focus on are now two goals. Goal number two, zero hunger, and goal number 13, climate action. Ladies and gentlemen, incredibly, global pests and diseases are responsible for up to 30 40% losses in all food crops, being worth 220 billion US dollars a year. The world population will increase to 10 billion by the year 2050, meaning that agricultural production must rise by 60% to feed the world. Plant health measures can stop or slow the spread of pests and reduce the losses and damages. International harmonized plant health measures can help low-income economies to be better protected against pests and diseases and to feed their population. History taught us that plant pests and diseases can cause food crisis and hunger, as with the Irish potato famine in the 1800s. More modern examples of possible and potential devastating pests and diseases is the fall armyworm, Spolptera fogiperda, which was introduced into Africa in 2016. The fall armyworm is a highly destructive pest on cereals and other important cultivated food crops. It is highly polyphagous. It can affect hundreds of different host plants. It can cause multi-billion US dollars damages in Africa alone, and there have been recent estimates by FAO that the damages in maize alone in Africa can be up to 6.6 .6 billion US dollars per year. It can spread very fast because it can fly up to 100 kilometers per night. The full army worm is endemic to the Americas and appeared in the Americas alone until 2016. In 2016, it was introduced into Africa, into a West African country. And within a two-year period, the fall armyworm has spread throughout uh, Sub-Sahel Africa and has infected almost every country within this region. It didn't stop in Africa. Already in 2018, it spread further to Yemen and to India. And from there, it spreads to the entirety of the tropical Asian continent. Even to Australia, it spread where it was found in 2020 for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, the full army worm is not just a perfect example how fast the pest can spread. Unfortunately, it is also an example of a pest which can cause a food crisis. FAO has judged that the reason COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting logistical problems in distributing food. Desert locust swarms of biblical proportions and the full army worm may actually combine to cause a food crisis in Africa during 2021 and 2022. The next issue which I would like to outline to you, ladies and gentlemen, is the climate change impacts on Climate change causes changes in the distribution of pests and diseases. And we have seen that the world's higher latitudes will experience more and more pests risks in the future. Already 
now in Europe there have been sightings of bark beetles uh, in areas where they have never been before and we have seen damages of bark beetles which uh, exceeded all previous years damages. Climate change affects interaction of plants and pest diseases and their interactions within their ecosystem. Uh, climatic parameters are important for many diseases to in fact penetrate a leaf or a stem and to cause disease. The water film uh, prevalent on leaves is for some diseases uh, an important parameter for its efficiency to infect a plant. Climate change affect trade routes and we will see that much more in the future. It has been predicted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that trade routes will change very much because we will have to deliver food to countries which will be hardest hit by climate change and which usually were the countries where food was sent to the industrial world. The effects of climate change I will demonstrate on the mountain pine beetle from North America, then talk to Nosponderosa. As its name suggests, the mountain pine beetle is a pest of pines in North America. It is very damaging. Its kill level in infested pine stands is 60 to 95 percent. It originated in the northwestern United States, but due to the increase of temperature, it has extended its range to the north and to the east, and can be found now along the, almost along the border to Alaska and to far east of Canada. It also has gone up in altitude because of warmer temperatures. It kills pine forests on an enormously large scale. And this large-scale tree mortality comes an increase in the potential uh, of forest fires occurring. Here you can see a large forestry area in British Columbia. You will notice all the brown trees. These are pine trees killed by the mountain pine beetle. Another picture from British Columbia even more pronounced than the previous one. Almost all the forests are dead, killed by the mountain pine beetle on an extremely large scale. And that's the end of that forest, killed by the mountain pine beetle, burned because dead trees burn very well, releasing carbon into the atmosphere, making the climate change effect even more pronounced, and what may even be worse, releasing toxic smoke, which may affect the health of our children. Ladies and gentlemen, in 2017, the then Director General of FAO, Jose Graziano da Silva, said, there is no peace without tackling food security and eliminating hunger. And there will be no food without tackling climate change. This sentiment is spot on. The effects of hunger and climate change will impact around the world and may cause environmental degradation, wars, economic crisis and consequently mass migration movements. And we have seen that over the past years here in Europe we had mass migration coming from areas which were ravaged by civil wars and by economic crisis. Plant health is an important tool to prevent hunger and to mitigate some of the effects of climate change. And we need to increase global efforts to improve plant health, which may partially mitigate these effects. Ladies and gentlemen, after presenting you with the rationale for the International Year of Plant Health and what is at stake, I would like to come now to the second part of my presentation, how a better cooperation between public and private sectors can improve plant health. And I would like to start this part of my presentation with an analysis, what is plant health worth to society? 
And here I received from my UK colleague, Professor Nicholas Spence, a very interesting analysis of what plant health is worth to the UK society. She estimated that the British society benefits in the range of 9 billion UK pounds from healthy crops and forestry. These 9 billion British pounds would be differentiated into 4 billion of cross value added from crop and horticultural sectors, 1 billion of direct commercial value of forestry and sawmilling, and 4 billion of social and environmental value of forestry and tree. In addition to that, she calculated that good plant health contributes to a good and vibrant food and drink export industry in the UK, which is worth 20 billion UK pounds, to a healthy outdoor recreation industry, which is worth about 20 billion pounds in the UK, and 175 billion pounds of asset value of trees, forest and woodlands. Altogether, one can calculate that plant health protects almost 200 25 billion UK pounds to the UK society. After the staggering numbers in the previous slides, let's look at the actual benefits of the profession sectors from plant health. And there are a number of factors to consider. The first one is through plant health policies, the professional sector benefits by having less losses through pests and diseases. Not having pests and diseases in the greenhouse, in the field, actually translate in actually savings for the producer. These savings are partially caused by having to apply less plant protection products. Less plant protection products equals more profit for the producer. Less pests and diseases means also better market access, especially when it comes to the export to other countries. The plant health situation in a country is one of the most important factors in getting an import a permit from, let's say, a country in the Americas. Less pests and diseases also means less red tape for certification purposes. Uh, if the plant health situation in the country is very positive, that means the sector needs to be inspected less, which means that costs by the professional sector in paying for inspections by the plant protection service is greatly reduced. It also means, for instance, that the cost for ordering a phytosanitary certificate can be reduced by either having no phytosanitary certificate requirement or in the best case when the plant protection service is very advanced, you have an electronic phytosanitary certificate. And the last, last point which I would like to raise is less disruptions through plant health incidents. Whenever there is an outbreak of a pest in a country, third countries immediately close their borders or make much stricter import legislation concerning the product on which this pest then could spread to this country. This means that in case, for instance, in an outbreak in one country A, country B, C, D and E immediately close their border and F, G and H issue very strict import controls. This is very costly for the producers in country A. These are just examples how the private sector can actually benefit financially very much from a very good plant protection status and system in a country. Despite these benefits for the private sector of good plant protection policies and efficient plant protection services, there's surprisingly quite a bit of skepticism within the private sector about plant health policies and plant protection services. In the over 30 years of my professional career as a plant, plant health official, I've heard 
a number of perceived shortcomings of plant health policies and services, and I've categorized them into five groups. The first group is, or the first perceived shortcoming, is that plant health policies are quite often considered as burdensome by the professional sector. The professional sector believes that it takes too much energy and too much money to fulfill these requirements, these plant health requirements, and that this is eating at their profits. Another perceived shortcoming, which I have heard over many years, is that they are considered impractical. Uh, it is quite often argued that requirements for inspections and so on are very impractical and very, very difficult to fulfill. In addition to that, the private sector quite often believes that plant health policies and plant health in general is overregulated, uh, uh, and that this overregulation actually, to a certain degree, is caused by protectionist uh, uh, considerations in order to keep imported products out of the country and to provide a healthy market for domestically produced uh, uh, products. The last point in my perceived shortcomings, it is quite often perceived that plant health is limiting the free market, and that plays very, very well together with the protectionate uh, consideration of plant health. In order to address these perceived shortcomings and to maximize the benefits for the private sector, it is actually good to have better stakeholder involvement, which can improve plant health policies and their implementation and foster understanding. Looking at the benefits of stakeholder involvement, one can see first the benefits for the public sector. Stakeholder involvement raises the political profile of plant health within the government policy. It increases public awareness because more people are involved in policy making and therefore know about the policies and actually know about the objectives. Uh, stakeholder expectations are known to the public sector when stakeholders are involved in policy making. With knowing what stakeholders expect, the public service knows exactly how they have to address the plant health legislation and policy. Having stakeholders involved in policy making also clearly increases the stakeholder awareness about the policy and about the plant health objectives of the service. It promotes the sustainability of the national plant protection organizations and it actually provides solutions in conflict situations because if producers know uh, uh, the plant protection officials very well, if there's a good cooperation, conflicts are resolved much easier. There are many more benefits of stakeholder involvement. For example, the creation of synergies between plant health and the private sector uh, will be facilitated through good cooperation. It will lead to the development of innovative systems where plant health policy and the expectations of the stakeholders, for instance with regard to export, may lead to the establishment of pest-free areas or pest-free places of production. It will actually lead to the facilitation of export activities, where the plant health officials know exactly what the private sector needs and they know exactly how to certify export uh, products for export to third countries. It may lead to the prioritization of resource allocation based on plant health policies and the development of cost-effective solutions in the private sector. It will certainly have uh, uh, a positive input on the building of adaptive capacity and it will actually provide uh, uh, resources to the MPPO because maybe some of the activities which usually the MPPO could do uh, would not have to be done anymore by the National Plant Protection Organizations but could be done in self-control by the producers. So in which areas can stakeholders help the public sector to develop 
policy and to implement them. On a political level, uh, uh, stakeholders can help in uh, uh, developing an overarching phytosanitary policy, in establishing phytosanitary regulations, establishing phytosanitary measures, and to establish a national phytosanitary dialogue. They can contribute to international corporations and to the positions in international organizations. On an operational level, which may be much more uh, uh, of interest to the private sector, we could see um, a better development of phytosanitary systems and programs, for instance, pest risk analysis systems, regionalization, diagnostic systems, systems approaches, surveillance, research coordination, eradication programs and contingency planning. Also in the information exchange and communications, uh, uh, stakeholders could very well contribute to the public service and could co cooperate with the public sector very well. Ladies and gentlemen, the success of stakeholder involvement in policy making and the establishment of phytosanitary systems is very much dependent on the amount of stakeholders in this consultation. It is not just an interplay between the private sector and the public sector. There are many different stakeholders, such like the press and the media, who play an important role in stakeholder relations. Only in a country where the stakeholder consultations reflect the society and the systems in place will be stakeholder involvement be beneficial for the public sector, the private sector and the entire country. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice conference, a nice conference. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to Ralph uh, for that excellent uh, presentation. And uh, Ralph joins us here now for question and answer session. Welcome, Ralph. And uh, if you have questions specifically for Ralph, please add them to the, uh, the chat on the stage tab so I can uh, keep an eye on them there and uh, pick them up to, to ask for Ralph. So yeah, thank you for that. Uh, it really helps to set the scene and thank you for um, putting that extra emphasis on the, how the private sector and uh, regulator sector will you know, can, can work together and the benefits of that. I wonder, do you have any uh, good examples of a, of a country where you could say that the private sector worked well with uh, the regulators to create policy that, that worked effectively for both sides? Uh, thank you very much for this question, Tim. You, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, very well. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, there are a number of countries in the world where there's a very good uh, uh, private public uh, 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 cooperation. Uh, um, if, if you look, for instance, uh, um, to Australia, to New Zealand, uh, there's a private public cooperation is very strong. Uh, you know, if you look, for instance, at the regional organization, you have, uh, for instance, the North American Plant Protection Organization has a very strong public private cooperation. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, there are a number of countries where the public private cooperation is very uh, strong. Uh, traditionally, that is, uh, in particular, in the Nordic countries, uh, 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 like Finland, where we have uh, uh, regular uh, 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 meetings with the, pub, uh, with the private sector. Uh, for instance, uh, in Finland, uh, uh, all legislation, all positions, for instance, within the EU are coordinated uh, with, with, uh, uh, with the private sector in, in a stakeholder consultation. And uh, we also have a, a, a plant health dialogue, uh, a stakeholder dialogue, which happens several times a year uh, between research, between education, between private enterprises and association and and the public sector. So uh, there are a number of countries where it happens, but we also see that in a number of countries, uh, there are deficiencies, uh, 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 very, very serious deficiencies. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yes, thank you. And I suppose when there are 
countries which still have deficiencies, then effectively you're still only as strong as your weakest link there, really. And, uh, and, and it, that can uh, uh, let down the whole system if there are such deficiencies in other countries. Yes, uh, uh, that is perfectly true. And uh, uh, when you have deficiencies in this regard to stakeholder involvement, uh, your legislation uh, tends to be not, uh, let's say, the soundest one. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, But to... Uh, uh, to help countries to find uh, a good stakeholder involvement uh, in the IPPC, we have developed uh, a stakeholder manual, uh, uh, how stakeholders can be very efficiently involved in national plant protection policy making and program making. So uh, if you go to the IPP website for those countries uh, which would need uh, uh, assistance or guidance how to implement that, there's a, a manual, uh, it's about 30 pages uh, of uh, advice given to uh, plant protection authorities how to uh, e implement uh, in the proper stakeholder consultation process. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. I think it's an area of regulation where, uh, well, uh, businesses are regulated in many ways and often in not a, a popular way. But here the industry clearly recognizes the benefit of good regulation in plant health because it's critical for the survival of the industry uh, as much as uh, as much as anything else satisfying yes. the environmental demands of it. Um, we have a question, uh, uh, John van Rauten uh, from Nachtonbau. He says, Ralph, thank you for your presentation. Is there an estimate which part of the huge global loss, 220 billion US dollars, is from regular, they call endemic pests and pathogens, and which is from recently introduced uh, invasive or exotic pests? Do you have a thought on that question? Uh, um, no. Uh, uh, F uh, these are numbers which have been published by FAO, by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, they are roundabout numbers and they include uh, all kinds of pests as well as uh, 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 post-harvest pests, uh, uh, storage pests and so on. So um, uh, uh, one must say that uh, uh, one trend which we are seeing, which we have been observing over the last years in the plant health sector, uh, uh, especially internationally, is that we have more and more uh, uh, serious pests uh, being introduced. Uh, this has caused more and more uh, serious uh, epidemics in, in a number of areas. I, I already gave the uh, uh, the uh, example of the fall armyworm, the Spodotop Spodoptera fugiperda, uh, for instance, if we look at Europe, we had some years ago, we had the introduction of Cilella in Italy, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, wiping out olive production, the southern part of Italy, and which is an existential threat to the olive production in the entirety of the uh, Mediterranean basin. Uh, as well, uh, it is a threat to the horticulture sector because it has such a huge host plant uh, uh, scope that uh, it will affect uh, uh, lots of different ornamental and perennial uh, horticultural plants. So, uh, so uh, direct answer: two hundred twenty billion. I cannot give a, a, a concrete uh, a categorization, but uh, uh, we are seeing more and more damages coming through introduced pests in recent years. Thank you. Now, I know you've put in a huge amount of work as chair of the um, organizing for the International Year of Plant Health. Um, I wonder what you are hoping to see as the legacy of, of this year. Uh, how do you think it's going to change things into the future? Um. Of course, the legacy is uh, the legacy is the all over important thing. What what I imagined and what in the steering committee we imagined is that in twenty years people still know that we had an international year of plant health and that plant health is important. That it's not just a fluke uh, uh, for a year and then everybody forgets about it, but that it stays in the consciousness of uh, uh, people, in the consciousness of uh, 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 politicians and decision makers that plant health is important. We have tried to uh, uh, trigger 
a number of activities, uh, which will not be just uh, limited to the International Year of Plant Health, but will continue in the future. Uh, one of these activities uh, uh, or one of the trigger uh, uh, activities which we have started is uh, uh, to mainstream uh, 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 plant health in the climate change debate. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, or uh, it is uh, very uh, uh, apparent that climate change will play an important uh, 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 factor in the distribution of pests to new areas. Uh, and we need to define our policies today to address this uh, in the near future. Uh, this is an effort which we're trying to initiate now during the international year, and we have commissioned an international scientific study on this matter, which will be published on the 1st of June uh, this year. Another important uh, aspect which we have uh, more and more triggered now is the inclusion of plant health into the One Health concept. Uh, 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 One Health uh, uh, is not just uh, uh, plant, uh, it's not just human and animal health. Uh, uh, one Health uh, is much more than that. It's uh, basically uh, trying to en uh, en encompass the entire planetary health, environmental health sector, and plant health plays an important role in that because of its biodiversity preservation uh, 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 activities. So uh, what we want is that uh, we will continue on a very high level with public awareness activities. And uh, we have, for instance, also uh, uh, started the procedure to have an International Day of Plant Health approved. Uh, uh, that we are hoping that the United Nations General Assembly will do that this uh, fall and that we would have uh, next year on the 12th of May, the first International Day of Plant Health. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Just one final uh, question because uh, the time has gone, but the questions are coming in. Um, do you uh, do you have a again from John at uh, Natuenbau? Do you have a suggestion how to connect private um, programs and results of self-control systems better to official inspection and certification systems? Uh, because nowadays, in many cases, the results cannot be used for official purposes. Uh, Yes, um, there is at the moment there is uh, a whole discussions in the uh, discussion in the IPPC uh, uh, how to involve third parties entities in the work of plant protection services in the certification uh, or in uh, in the plant health policies of uh, of national plant protection organisations. Currently, the IPPC is developing an international standard on this issue. Uh, how if you involve private enterprises, if you involve private sector in certain activities, which the MPPO should usually do, uh, this standard will regulate how to do that. And uh, uh, so that it is also for third countries uh, a reliable system. Because uh, in some countries which have tried to involve the private sector in MPPO activities, uh, this has sometimes met with criticism from the countries where they sent their products to, uh, which then argued uh, that is not reliable if you include the private sector. Uh, now in the IPPC, we are trying to establish such a standard which should regulate that on an international basis so that uh, everybody who is uh, involving the private sector in MPPO activities uh, uh, can actually do that according to a standard and such be officially recognized as doing uh, in compliance with the IPPC. I hope I have answered John's question there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's. Uh... That's very helpful. Um, we have other questions coming in, but we've run out of time for, for these. If you have a moment, um, Ralph, maybe you could pop some answers in, in the chat uh, for some of those, if you have a moment yourself. Uh, but now we must move on. But, but really, thank you very much for your time for this. And congratulations on raising the profile of plant health through the International Year of Plant Health. From the industry, we're very thankful. And uh, we appreciate what you have done. Thank you. Thank you very much.